just pause and remember that we are in the presence of God. Gracious God, in each of us you have instilled a dignity no one can diminish. May we honor this dignity in others and in ourselves by the respect we show in our words and in our behavior beyond words. Let us not forget the most vulnerable among us and those who have ministers to and a special blessing on you, Pat, as you build the kingdom of God. Our deepest respect is due to all persons, all ages. In gratitude for your love that completes us, we say, Amen. the sisters at the monastery, St. Paul's Monastery, and she had an aunt, Sister Laverne Padala, which I see some of those relatives here this evening. And if you didn't know Laverne, she was a very interesting woman. And we miss Laverne. And I do invite the family to return to the monastery and um, visit Sister Laverne's grave and pop on in. Okay, please do that. So, I am going to welcome our fearless leader and who is a lover of the book and a lover of hospitality and the charism of this school. Let us welcome <coughs> President Melissa Day. our speaker this evening, Dr. Patricia Barrett-Wolf. Uh, as a young girl, Patricia attended a presentation in St. Peter's. She was inspired at the young age of 12 to serve others as a medical missionary. Her experience at Archbishop Murray High School nurtured that dream, and she continued to pursue it by earning her medical degree at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Wolf spent last week, Catholic Schools Week, in fact, anyone who works in Catholic School is well aware of that, uh, in Catholic supporting local workers and the community, and she'll tell you more about that this evening, as she worked to address severely malnourished children under difficult but not impossible conditions in Haiti. Dr. Wolf credits her Catholic education for helping her choose a path as a pediatrician and eventually leading to the founding of Meds and Food for Kids, a nonprofit organization that has helped save 700,000 children's lives over the past 20 years. Meds and Food for Kids works in Haiti and helps families and children in 17 additional countries. Dr. Wolf now serves as their senior advisor, which is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. She will be joining uh, us at Hill Murray tomorrow to speak with some of our students and have lunch. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Wolf. Thank you. 
<clears throat> my um, my 12 years of Catholic education really uh, shaped my life in terms of um, values and um, being uh, and understanding very early that the key to happiness was really serving others. I mean, if you just serve yourself, it's not very not very meaningful. And meaningfulness has always been. Um, you know, a goal of mine, and I, so it started in, I would say, first grade, where there was 60 kids, you know, this is the baby boom, right, and 60 kids, one month, and we were all supposed to learn how to read and write and do arithmetic. So the nun, very young, like, nun, a very young woman, um, figured out that there was kids who got it, you know, the, the kind of like just got the, what it, the decoding that you needed to read, and there were kids who weren't getting it. So she sat the ones who got it next to the ones who didn't get it, and then she said to the ones who got it, you got it? Yeah, teach it. <laughs> and, and, and I was one of the ones who got it, and I thought, oh, well this is cool. <laughs> And it so it, you know made me feel important, right, and um, and useful, and but and it was very helpful to the my partner who who didn't get it. If you ask me today how to teach somebody to read, I wouldn't be able to tell you, but I knew then because I had just decoded it myself. So I said, well, it's just like this, and um, and then the the other child would learn to read. And so that was a, 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 a very kind of shaping um, experience for me that if you could be of service to others, it would really enhance your own happiness. And so then <coughs> third grade came. We had a, um, you're supposed to learn, of course, multiplication, division, and how to write um, book reports, right? In third grade, it's hard. Um, <laughs> We had a storytelling one, and she told us stories, and, and she we did learn multiplication, division, and how to write book reports. But she spent a lot of time telling us stories about missionaries in Asia, and we she asked us to ask our parents to bring our extra change in to support. Now this is politically incorrect, but we called it pagan baby. <laughs> And if we supported, if we brought in enough money to support a baby, baby, we got to name them. And I remember one of them, we got to vote on this. And we voted on Zorro. Food. 
food, education, and lots of people can only just dream of that. They don't have it. You have it. And because you are so blessed, you owe it to these other people to think about how you could share what your blessings are with them because you have anything that you need plus more. And you need to you know, share that. And this was like a repeated theme. Came to high school. My mother made me come to Archbishop Morgan. I wanted to go to a co-ed school because I kind of like boys. <coughs> and she said, nope, nope, you're going to Archbishop Murray. And so I, I did. And I, and I loved it. It was perfect for me. It was a place where you could be, um, you could safely be smart. And you could safely be hardworking and be kind of a nerd and a grind. And it was still OK. I mean, there was going to be somebody who appreciated it. And, uh, and we were, there's lots of leadership opportunities. And we were very well supported. Nobody ever failed as a leader of anything. And there was lots and lots of leaders and lots and lots of clubs and opportunities to be that. So, and again, the corporal works of mercy. You know, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, um, comfort the sick, um, repeatedly, all the time. And you started out every class with that in all things God made me glorify. So it was just a way of thinking about your life and a framework for um, serving others, and uh, which just was expected of all of us. There's many ways to do that, of course. And I think everybody in this room does that in their own way. Um, but my particular way was that, um, was uh, to buy a doctoring. So um, I don't think I recognized it at the time, but the school was run by women and quite expertly, but nothing ever went wrong. So that was my, you know, I just, you know, when you're a kid, you don't really know all the machinations that happen behind the, behind the, behind the curtain. Um, but one day, um, I was called to meet with the principal, Sister Claire. <laughs> the hoodlums from a hill, particularly. <laughs> <laughs> she would get on the PA system and say, the hoodlums from a hill are in the parking lot again. You know this is against the rules. You can only be picked up by your brother or your father or your uncle. You cannot get in those cars with those hoodlums from hill and I'm going out there to chase them right now. <laughs> I never saw her chase them, but I believe that she did. So, <laughs> so anyway. So I'm, uh, this is like the uh, spring of my senior year, and I'm called in to see Sister Claire. She never has called me in to see her before. I mean, of course, I know her, and she showed up at lots of meetings and like that. But, so um, I don't know what the agenda is here. So she says, um, I hear that you're going to the University of Minnesota. And I said, yes. And she said, um, you know, they have atheists there. <laughs> But not too many. And too many, she said, too many. You're going to lose your faith there. And I go, well, no, I don't think so. And then there was a long pause, and she said, I heard that you're going to be a free man. And I said, yeah. And she said, why is that? <clears throat> you want to be a doctor? I said, yes. Women shouldn't be doctors. She said, oh. And I said, um, <clears throat> well, I, I'm. I'm, I'm feeling a little irritated, and I said, uh, uh, well, I'm going to be a doctor. I always wanted to be a doctor. I'm going to be a doctor. She said, you know, it's very hard. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm on board. She said, and even if you get through medical school, because you're smart, you know, the life of a doctor is very difficult, and it's 24-7. She didn't use these words because they were used in it. You always have to be away from home and whatever, and it's not for women. Um, not that you couldn't do the work, but it's not for women. And I said, well, that's what I'm going to be. <clears throat> and she said, aren't you a normal woman? Don't you, <laughs> you want to get married and have children? And I thought, what is wrong here? <laughs> yeah. And uh, I said, well, you know, I don't know. I'm not thinking about it. Um, maybe. I don't care. I want to be a doctor. That's what I want to be. And maybe I'll get married. Maybe I won't. She said, I 
I'd advise against it. And I said, well, I have to get to class now, so thank you for the counseling. And I, and, and, but, I, I, but I was mad. And over, you know, all the, my years in pre-med and medical school, when things were going hard, I thought, I'm not giving up. I'm not giving it to Sister Claire. <laughs> She animated my my uh, my uh, you know persistence in, in this hard work. So um, <clears throat> so here I am. I'm, I, there are a lot of uh, there. Are, it was hard, and I soldiered on, and I uh, graduated medical school, and I um, and I needed health service, and I did an internship and residency, and I was in private practice, and now it's 1977. And I'm at home because on maternity leave because I'm having my second child. And the phone rings. And I pick up the phone, hello? Pat? Yes? This is Sister Claire. Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> How did she find me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm home, there's Wendy. And I go, oh, Sister Claire, how are you? <laughs> she said, it's, uh, so I hear that from Sister Laverne that you're Said, ah, uh huh. And um, and um, and are you married? Yes. Uh huh. And do you have children? Yes. Uh huh. Are they happy? <laughs> is your is your husband happy? Oh, that seems so. She said, uh huh. And uh, and do you work? And I said, yes. I'm a home on maternity leave now. Ah, she. So you work and then you leave your children where? <laughs> and, I, and, uh, and I should say, well, you know, they have wonderful uh, caretakers and whatever. And she said, uh-huh. Well, so nice to talk to you, Sister Claire. I have to go now. <laughs> and, and again, I was, I, I really thought then, I don't think just now, but I thought then, that she was calling me to be sure that she was right and that I was suffering and unhappy. But, but in thinking it through as a, as a more mature person and a less reactive person, um, I really think that the first interview and the second interview were really about how we had all been young women who had been liberated and we were, you know, no one ever used the word feminist, but by God, we were feminists. And we believed that girls could do anything, and we could do anything. And I think she worried that she had oversold that, and that she was setting us up for a life of disappointment when we got out there in the patriarchy, and people were washing us down. But little did she know that we were warriors, too, and we were going to stand up to it and, um, and call it out whenever we saw it and, and carry on. And I think that the second phone call was just to be sure that I was okay, actually. And um, not that she was trying to trying to be right. She just had to quiz me in all these ways to be sure that I was okay. And that was, and she was the leader of the school. Other people were less scary than she in the school, but, um, but, they, but it was a very caring, um, caring group of uh, educators and uh, nuns, and, and then only one other scary person, Sister Scholastica in the library. <laughs> but um, I, I don't know what her backstory was, but you didn't have to see her very often. <laughs> Anyway, I was 41 before I actually made it on a medical mission. One day, my kids, who were 11 and 14 boys, came home from school and they said, how come we don't have a swimming pool? I said, well, we don't need a swimming pool. They said, well, how come we don't have an extra house in the backyard where we can put a pool table and have fun with our friends? And I go, what? They said, you have more than 99.9% .9 of the people in the world. Get a grip. And they roll their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it is time to bring these kids out. And so um, uh, there was a couple in St. Louis who had been Peace Corps volunteers in Haiti. And they, for years, had been taking high school students, college students, and doctors, nurses, families, sometimes Haiti. So we signed up with them. 
went to Haiti in 1988. In 1986, uh, Baby Doc was unceremoniously and violently picked out. And in 1988, there was like dead bodies on the street that nobody wanted to pick up. We stayed in a, a orphanage that was actually all the work was done by boys. And we visited um, Mother Teresa's home for dying children, Mother Teresa's home for dying adults. And they were, every single one of them, dying needlessly for lack of something very simple like TV medicine or an operation for appendicitis or an IV or amoxicillin. I mean, it was very, very, very grim. And then the, the leader um, had, who did microcredit before Muhammad Yunus got the Nobel Peace Prize for doing microcredit, had given some money to some people way up the mountain to build the clinic. And he said, if you build, and they had no health care up there, and um, if you build a clinic, I, they will come. I will bring some doctors. So they had built the clinic, and he brought me and another uh, doctor from St. Louis and a nurse up there. And we carried whatever we could on horses and donkeys up the mountain. And the first morning, 300 people had walked across the mountain all night long to see us. 300 people. With never three people who were able to see the, us three providers. And um, we had only whatever we brought with us. And, um, and it wasn't anything that was going to help them, really. I mean, they had never seen a doctor. They had god awful things that required operations, long term TV medicine, a heart operation, you know, all kinds of things. And we couldn't see 300 people in one day. So we had to say to them, you know, we're sorry, we're just going to take the first 100 and do our best. And um, if you, here's a little ticket from back from work. And they left, of course, and they had to walk another day back. Um, and some of them came back over the next couple of days, but not very many of them. And it was, you know, our first um, shocking personal experience with the, um, the depth of the, of the uh, need, you know, the, the width and the breadth of the, of the need in, in the country. Um, so when we, when I left, um, we, we were all changed forever. My kids never asked me for anything ever again. And, um, we, and I thought to myself, you know, I do have this education, and if you could do something, you should do something. So I found this group from North Carolina, Methodist people, um, very academic Methodist people, who uh, had been building clinics and wells and churches and schools in the north of Haiti, which is not, we, we had been in Port-au-Prince for this first visit, which is a completely different world from the north of Haiti or any other small town in Haiti. So um, I started going into the Capetian area in the north and was in a village clinic. <coughs> and um, we, I would come one week, first I came one week a year, then two weeks a year, then three weeks a year, then four weeks a year, and we brought all of our medicine, we were very organized, and we did have chronic medication for hypertension and uh, uh, maybe some oral anti-diabetics, although there weren't very many diabetics then, there were no, no asthmatics actually, and no food allergies, um, which is another story, but, um, but after a while, I mean, you would come back and one child would be sick again or another child would have died while you were there. Not when it was you were gone because malnutrition causes you to be immune deficient. And you don't die of starvation, you die of infectious disease. Uh, and so the kids were all dying of infectious diseases because they were all malnourished. And they were malnourished because their parents didn't have any money and they didn't have any money because they didn't have a job. So what were, you, what were you to do? And every day you would see these um, ladies, market ladies, walk by. They have a, uh, their head, you know, piled high on their head. Their, what, whatever was in the basket that they were going to sell in the market, and they over their arm would be a chair. And they were, you knew they were leaving their kids behind. And they'd go to the market, they'd sell whatever they would, they could. They would come home, they would leave at dawn, they would come back at dusk. And 
um, then they have to, then they've left their kids behind, right? So the neighbors are taking care of the kids, or maybe an old granny or an auntie or something um, is taking care of the kids. But the kids aren't eating all day because there's nobody to cook it and there's only fuel for one meal a day. So she would have gathered at the market something to, th you know, something to throw in the pot and maybe some charcoal to cook it. She would cook it and then the kids would eat it all as fast as they could. And the big kids got their hand in the pot more often than the little kids. So the malnourished kids were always the kids less than five but almost always less than three because they just couldn't get in that pot often enough. And then the day was over and there was no um, there was no refrigeration, there were no leftovers, and then there would be nothing to eat until the next day. And there was a, there's a plant called um, the Aki fruit plant, and, uh, and it causes something which is called Jamaican vomiting sickness. And if you, the fruit, it looks very good, but if you, if you pull it off and eat it and it's not ripe, it will cause you to be vomit because you get hypoglycemia. Your blood sugar gets very low. And if you eat enough of it and you're young enough and skinny enough or malnourished enough, you will have a persistent, deadly hypoglycemia. And one day, we were on the road coming back from this clinic and we, we were flagged down by some people who had this child in their arms who was like five and just comatose. And they said, take her to the hospital, take her to the hospital. And okay, so we took her to the hospital and um, there was it was dark. They didn't have any diesel or electricity, so it was now, now it was dark in the emergency room. There's no lights, there's no electricity, there's no IVs, there's no dextro sticks, there's no nothing. So we have to go to pharmacies and get IV tubing, IV liquid, and um, and uh, blood glucose six to check. So we find out, of course, that she's hypoglycemic because the story is that she got home from school, she was really hungry, there was no food, she pulled off this fruit and she ate it and she died within um, 12 hours in the hospital. So, and then there, so then there are the things that don't kill you, but imagine, do you know what scabies is? You know, it's, uh, it's like little mites that get under your skin and you itch them, and then when you itch them, they get infected, so then now you've got impetigo in addition to having all these itchy things all over. Well, the treatment for this is to put this cream on, to first take a bath, then put this cream all over your body, you know, and wash all your bedding. There is no bedding to wash. Wash all of your clothes. There is no place to wash anything. Everything's washed in the river. Everything's, there's no running water. There's, there's nothing. So, so imagine a whole family with scabies and impetigo who's been given this medicine by the doctor but can't comply with any of the things that would actually make the medicine work because they don't have running water, they don't have soap, they don't have access to any of the things that would happen. And that won't kill you, but it takes a really long time to go away um, if you don't have any kind of um, running water. <coughs> Um, and then, and that's not even to mention the, the um, people with the chickens and who um, cannot afford to feed them to their kids. They have to sell them um, and in order to keep body and soul together. And then their skeletal babies. And uh, we didn't have anything then to treat um, malnutrition with and the hospital didn't either. So those kids were just, um, put kind of in the corner. And, you know, the merciful thing that happens with um, malnourished kids is they're not hungry anymore. Mm -hmm. And they don't cry anymore. And the bigger kids cry and complain and pull on you and whatever, and you feed them and you just sit this kid over here. And the grandmother agrees and the neighbor agrees and the auntie agrees that kid's not gonna make it. Don't waste any of the resources on that kid. So it was a terrible thing to experience. And about this time that I was getting very um, discouraged, but it kind of seemed like what we were doing was kind of like spitting in the ocean. 
um, my colleague at Washington University um, was developing in um, Malawi this recipe for ready to use therapeutic food, uh, which is peanuts, powdered milk, sugar, oil, vitamins, and minerals. Now, to this time, the World Health Organization's recommendation was something close to that without the peanuts. So milk, sugar, oil, and vitamins and minerals, but you could never find it anywhere. And it required refrigeration, and it needed, um, and it needed a nurse, and you needed to be in the hospital. Well, there's no such thing as a free hospital. Even if it's a government hospital, you have to buy your own food, you have to um, pay for all medicines, and also you had to stay there for a month. And at the end of the month, 25% of the children were die, 25% were better, and 50% were no change. So for people who live on a dollar or two a day, this was not a bargain. And they were not showing up to treat their kids. They were just putting them in the water until they died. And so we started making this. Uh, so Mark Maneri, my, my colleague, said, this is what you should do. You should just put peanuts uh, one fourth peanuts, one fourth sugar, one fourth milk, and one fourth oil together. And that's basically the recipe. <clears throat> and then give the kid a vitamin, because you don't have any mineral mix, vitamin, mineral mix, you just give them a one a day of children's chewable vitamin, and that'll work for you. So we went to the market and we bought all these four things peanuts, powdered milk, sugar, oil, and, um, and I brought some vitamins gummy bears from the United States. And we started, we took it to a guy with a grinder on the street, and he ground it up when that's sanitary, but uh, everyone's kind of immune who isn't dead uh, to all these food germs and hate. And, um, and it was miraculous, it really was. So these like lifeless kids, within giving them twice their caloric needs of this um, paste, which is right here for you to test if you're not um, paying attention. Um, uh, perk them up and their, you know, their hair had fallen out or it had turned white or it had turned red. And it, then they got, within two weeks, they got black roots and they're like running around the clinic. It was just, it was amazing for everyone to see the nurses, the doctors, because you know, I mean, it's very demoralizing for healthcare providers to not be able to do anything for people, you know, and to see them just languish or, or die. Um, I mean, that's why we, we all want to be able to cure people. And so it was really, it was really miraculous. And um, we uh, got our own hand grinder, and um, the Methodists let us use their, uh, their, um, uh, schoolroom, and then we moved to a lady's house, and then to a slum, and then to another place where they, everybody had a fight up here, up the mountain, and they cut off the water, and then to another house. Anyway, and then the earthquake happened in 2010, and um, people took notice of me, and they took notice of meds and food for kids, and we got a lot of donations, and we built a big factory. And then about five years ago, we renovated the factory and added a lot more capacity. And now we're installing solar. And so this year, UNICEF has put out a big alert that um, malnutrition has tripled in the world. And it's, uh, it is an, uh, an emergency for the world's children. We're going to lose a whole generation of children unless we get on it. And the Gates Foundation, which has never, ever funded malnutrition treatment because they're all about teaching a man to fish rather than giving him a fish. You know? um, but this year, they gave $800 million to UNICEF to treat malnourished kids, and USAID gave them $500 million. And, but there's not enough manufacturing capacity in the world. So UNICEF came to us, and they said, um, we want you to max out, so we want you to triple your output. We said, you know, we can do that, but we can't, we don't have the cash flow to buy the raw materials, and so we're in negotiations with them now to prepay a little bit of it or something, because we want, this is, this is our time to really make a big dent in the problem in the world. Um, and so we're kind of out beating the bushes to find funding to be able to buy the raw materials to make this up and treat the 250 to 400,000 Haitian children who are severely malnourished. And there's these global um, uh, kids who are, you know, UNICEF is our customer and we have exported a buyer UNICEF to 17 countries, the stuff that's made in Haiti now. We have 
88 workers um, who depend on us, and each of them have like seven dependents, and, uh, and they all have a house now, and they all send their kids to school now because they have these, they have these jobs. And our peanut farmers used to have their children in our malnutrition program, and their children are no longer malnourished because we and I want to, just before I show you the video, I just want to tell you this story about Alexon. So Alexon was uh, uh, brought to a clinic that was down the road from us, about an hour. And, um, and I got a phone call about him. And he was 77 years old, and he weighed 29 pounds. And he called, his hair was white, his skin was white, and he wasn't, he was lethargic, but he wasn't comatose or anything because he was seven, right? He wasn't an infant. And so the, um, the wonderful volunteers at Danita's Children, it's called, they, I, they said, you know, we, we, need your, we need your medical mama. So we, had, we, we delivered it to them, and they kind of fed him like a bird and kept, them with him, kept him with them, like slept with them 24-7. They were always with him. And they were always feeding him, always feeding him. So this is November, this is December, this is January. And uh, within two years, he was the um, star of the soccer team. And he's now a counselor in their orphanage in school. Yeah. So, you know, it makes a difference if you would the reason um, I want you to see this video is that I can't, you know, uh, uh, images, we're all used to images, and you always think you know what something looks like, but you don't really until you go there, and you probably not going to have the opportunity to go there, but then maybe some of you have, but um, I think that you, if you see it, I think it means more to you and it sticks in your brain more than my words do. Since 2003, Meds and Food for Kids has been dedicated to reversing malnutrition in Haiti and around the world, while also sustainably stimulating economic development. 88 Haitian women and men work in our factory, producing ready-to-use therapeutic foods to help meet the essential nutritional needs of malnourished children, pregnant and nursing women, and school kids, giving them a chance to thrive. Together with thousands of medical professionals, school teachers, and farmers, MFK is creating a better future for Haiti, one with access to nutrition, jobs, and improved livelihoods. Despite our tremendous progress, today we face new challenges due to the pandemic, political unrest, an onslaught of natural disasters, and shortages of critical resources. Join us in our ongoing work toward a better future and together find ways to change Haiti and the world. My name is Remenson Tenor. I am the Director of Manufacturing Operations here at Meds and Food for Kids. I am in charge of the whole manufacturing processes. My job is to make sure that we actually deliver what we actually plan. After high school, I got the scholarship where I went to St. Louis to study industrial engineering technology. As part of the scholarship, you made the commitment to return to Haiti. And I love living in Haiti. I knew about MFK for a while, and I was always looking for the opportunity. So I applied, and here I am. So I'm here in charge of operations. At MFK's 19,000 square foot factory, located outside of Cap Haitian, 88 Haitian employees produce four life-saving products used in Haiti and around the world. Medica Mamba for treating severe acute malnutrition. Mamba John for treating moderate malnutrition. Plumpy Does for expectant and nursing mothers. And Vita Mamba, our school snack. The staff, they are proud because they know that what they do in Haiti contribute to save lives of other children, not only for Haiti, in Africa, in, in Venezuela, in other countries. So it's really 
a way for our people to contribute and to earn it and to have that pride that they're actually making something positive. I have two little girls. Everything that I do at MFK is I want to later on in my life to sit down with my daughters to see this is what I've accomplished. You know, this product that you are seeing on TV or you see on that website, I make it. I contribute to make that. It's not just the job, but this is what your dad actually make happen. Last year, MFK produced a record of over 1,340 tons of life-saving products, treating over 102,000 malnourished children, moms, and school kids. We are able to keep our employees just because what we are doing, because other organizations are trying to grab them from time to time, but they say we are okay because we believe on the mission of Medicine Food for Kids. My name is James Blanc, so I am the Agricultural Program Manager. I graduated with a Bachelor in Plant and Soil Science. I always thought that after I graduated, I wanted to, to, to come back to my country and serve. Using local peanut is very important to us, because if we go out there and buy peanut from local farmers, we're basically providing to those families, and we are using the, the products to save uh, malnourished kids. The former training program is a program that we put in place in order to train peanut farmers. So we talk about soil preparation, we talk about uh, soil conservation, we talk about how they can prepare seeds to plant for next year. Uh, we also talk about post-harvest post management. After the training, they are ready to not only increase their production, but also provide to MFK better quality of peanuts. So it's very important to us, this program. It means a lot to us to uh, train farmers to produce better quality of peanuts as they are able to increase their income also so they can feed their family. At the same time, we are using local peanuts to save lives. So it's like a win-win situation. This year was special to us because we haven't been able to uh, purchase a lot of uh, peanuts from other countries like we used to do in the past. So the work that we have been done with farmers have, has been paid off because our farmers are increasing their production and the quality of products that we are getting in Haiti are getting better and better. Meds and Food for Kids collaborates with over 200 clinics, schools, and other organizations to improve nutrition outcomes for entire families. Our team of nurse educators serves 12 malnutrition clinics across Haiti. Parents and caregivers work with Haitian nurses to bring these sick, lethargic children back up to a healthy weight, one sachet at a time. My name is Magdala Jacques Borgela. I am nurse educator in MFK since March 2018. When children receive medical mamba, we can see the difference because after one week, only one week, we can see the children change. And this change is miraculous, giving them a second chance to learn and grow. In 2021, we treated over 102,000 children and moms. While we will continue to provide malnutrition treatment, the ultimate goal is prevention. During the first 1,000 days, from conception to age two, nutrition plays a pivotal role in cognitive and physiological development. By supplementing pregnant and nursing moms, we put children on the path to a healthy future at the very beginning of their lives. The supplementation program is a great investment because when, when lactating women, women receive mamba jump, they have sufficient milk to feed their children. But our efforts to prevent malnutrition don't stop with mothers. There are over 1 million children ages 6 to 12 in school in Haiti. On average, 22% of these children are chronically undernourished and over 65% are anemic. Our Vita Mamba school snack is designed to address the micronutrient deficiencies that cause stunting and delayed development. Teachers tell us that students are more engaged and active. Vita Mamba works to make these children healthier, heavier, and able to learn in the best possible way. In AD, usually the school children, they don't have uh, nothing to eat. But when we give 
um, Vidamamba and the school, they can pass all the day without eating nothing. MFK works to provide a hand up, not a hand out. What these families lack in resources, they possess in immeasurable hope and resilience. With your support, we will continue making an investment in these kids, the next generation of Haiti. Their success and the future success of Haiti depends on it.